everyone and welcome once again to another edition of Truce from the Gateway. I'm Pastor Boyd Bingham, so very glad that you've joined me. It's my prayer that you can stay with me over the next few moments and it's also my sincere and fervent prayer that these moments together will be a blessing to you. And if you want to know more about Jesus, I believe that it will be a blessing to you. I'm often reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 at verse 10. And listen to what he says. After being a Christian for over 40 years, he writes that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And after 40 years of being saved, Paul still had a desire to know more about Jesus. I pray today that you have that very same desire in your heart, that you want to know more about him. And like never before, I want to preach him. I think about Paul's words to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 18 he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And then in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning at verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything else among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is the time. This is the hour that we need to preach Jesus. I want you to stay with me because that's going to be the emphasis once again of today's message. We've been noticing over the previous messages that Jesus is our hope and Jesus is our helper. And then we're noticing that Jesus is our high priest. And today in this particular message, we're going to recognize together that Jesus, He is the one that is our expectation. He is our hope. And Jesus is our resuscitation, our helper. He breathes life into us. And Jesus is our representation at the right hand of the Father. And then we're going to notice together, Jesus is our unchanging foundation. Stay with me. We're going to be looking at these truths together. There's one thing that I'm sure of today. I am sure of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not sure about this pandemic. I'm not sure about what's true or false. And my heart breaks for all of those that have died. And I pray for their families on a daily basis. I'm not sure about some of the information, some of the propaganda. But there is one thing that I am certain of. I am certain that it is Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. So if you have a Bible nearby, I want you to find the book of Hebrews. I believe that we're going to be blessed together. It's right before the little letter of James in the New Testament. It's easily found. Stay with me. I believe it's going to be encouraging because the Apostle Paul, he was doing his very best to encourage these Hebrew believers that were considering going back. And let me show you what they wanted to go back to. They wanted to go back to the Old Testament. They wanted to go back to the tabernacle. Or they wanted to go back to Solomon's temple. And of course in their day, it was Herod's temple. Look at this beautiful pictorial of the tabernacle and the wilderness. In today's message, I'm going to explain some of this to you. From the door, to the brazen altar, to the brazen laver, and then to the table of showbread within the holy place. Can you see the menorah over on the left side, the lampstand? And then we're going to notice together the mercy seat, a replica right behind me of the mercy seat. And that's the place of atonement. A-T-O-N-E-M-E-N-T. -E -E that we can come into it one minute with God. And in the New Testament, we find it in the word reconciliation. That we can be reconciled unto God put back in order, back in place. It represents uh, all the balancing of the books. And it also represents the setting of a broken bone or a bone that is out of joint 
reconciled unto God. That's the reason that Jesus came. Stay with me now. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And there the Bible says that we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me, and he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. And I'm offering this great little booklet by a preacher of yesteryear by the name of John R. Rice, and it's never forsaken, never alone. It's an easy read, but I believe it will be a blessing to you if you'll write to me. I'll get that out to you as soon as possible. Never alone, never forsaken, based upon Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Stay with me now. Great gospel song, and I'll be right back with today's Bible message.
I'm so very thankful that we can simply say today that it's in Christ alone. He is the only Savior. He is the only name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 at verse 12. And He is our sure, sufficient, and unshakable foundation. We're going to notice today that Jesus is our hope. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. And Jesus is our helper. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 and 6. And Jesus is our great high priest, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And when we think about Jesus being our hope, He is our expectation. And when we consider the fact that Jesus is our helper, He is our resuscitation. I'll explain that a little bit later on. And then when we consider that Jesus is our great high priest, he is our representation. But let's notice, first of all, He is our foundation. Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to what the Bible says here in the 27th verse. In the first part of this chapter, Paul has encouraged us to look unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. But now in verse 27, listen to what he says. He says, everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken, so that the things that cannot be shaken might remain. Now be reminded, in the context of this particular verse of Scripture, Paul is writing to Hebrew believers, and now they're going through a great season of persecution. The apostolic miracles in Jerusalem have come to a close. And now they are suffering there in Jerusalem itself. And God is using this suffering so that they'll be scattered. So that they'll go into all the world with the preaching of the gospel. But now uh, they have thought, they have considered that they have believed in vain. Surely if we had believed the truth we wouldn't be going through these great trials of sufferings. And so Paul is doing everything that he can possibly do to encourage them. And they wanted to go back. And many times when we have difficulties in our Christian lives, we are tempted and we are tried to consider going back to the old life. I think that all of us have to be reminded that there's nothing to go back to. And that's exactly what Paul was doing with these Hebrew believers. And so he refers again to the elements of the Old Testament and to the tabernacle itself. And of course the tabernacle in the wilderness, it became Herod's temple. But all the elements were there from the door and then you see the brazen laver where the sacrifice was offered up before God and the priest would catch the blood of a spotless lamb and then the laver where the priest would wash and then inside the holy place, the lampstand, the menorah on the left side and then the table of showbread on the right side and then the Ark of the Covenant, the representation of the Ark of the Covenant is right here behind me. All of these were elements that represent the Lord Jesus Christ in His finished work for us on the cross. Paul writing to the Galatians in the fourth chapter, verse 9, he says, Do you desire to return to the weak and beggarly elements that can never give you liberty? Do you desire again to be in bondage? And so they were contemplating going back. And today, the application for us is simply this, after you've been saved after you know that Jesus has come into your heart and you've been regenerated and born again, there's no possibility that you can go back to the old life that you were once involved in and ever be satisfied and ever find contentment. I'm telling you, there ought to be a change when Jesus comes into your heart. And there should be a new desire, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, at verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, what? All things have become new. And the things that you used to do, or the things that you wanted to do, the Lord has changed your want to. And now you've got a desire to please Him. And so He tells us that all the things that can be shaken are going to be shaken, and it happened. 
Oh, in A.D. 70, Titus, the Roman general, came into Jerusalem. And this is what Jesus talked about in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. And he destroyed their temple. The priesthood was lost. The order that they once knew that was given to them, even back on Mount Sinai, all of that was decimated. It was lost. And that's what Paul is talking about. All the things that can be shaken are going to be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken, they might remain. And he's talking about that unshakable one and his name is Jesus. He goes a little bit further in the 13th chapter and at verse 8, listen to what he says. It's Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today and he is the same forever. Notice with me very quickly now of how that we can stand upon this rock-solid foundation, how that it's been unshakable now for 2,000 years, how that Jesus gave the promise in Matthew chapter 16 at verse 18, upon this rock, the rock of myself, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And I know that many would say he's talking about building the church upon Simon Peter. Are you kidding me? Knowing what Peter was going to do yonder in the shadow of the cross and how that he was going to deny him. He was actually saying there in Matthew chapter 16 at verse 18, Peter, you're just a little pebble, but I am the rock. And upon the rock of myself, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Let's go back over there to the 16th chapter of the book of Hebrews, or I should say the 6th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And let's begin there and notice what he says in verses 19 and 20 of this 6th chapter. He talks about the hope that we have in our wonderful Lord. And listen to what he says, which hope we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth in into that within the veil. Let me show you the tabernacle once again. You see, one time of the year on the great day of atonement, in modern Israel, it's called Yom Kippur. The high priest could enter in all the way behind the veil in the Holy of Holies, there to the mercy seat to present the blood of a spotless lamb. Now, Jesus did that for us once and for all. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, when Jesus died on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, John chapter 19, verse 30, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, signifying that it was the work of God and signifying also to us that now we have access to God through what Jesus has done for us. And now Jesus, the forerunner, and this word forerunner that we find here in the sixth chapter, it's an interesting word, especially for someone like me that lives here in eastern Kentucky. It means a trailblazer. I introduced the program, Truce from the Gateway. I live and I'm preaching right now from the shadows of the Cumberland Gap, where Daniel Boone blazed a trail westward in the 1700s. By 1783, the close of the Revolutionary War, in that one year, 300,000 people came through the Cumberland Gap, where I'm seated at right now, on their way westward, and it was called the Gateway to the West. And so we find that Daniel Boone, he was a trailblazer of the Wilderness Road. But even greater than that, Jesus is our trailblazer that gives us access into the very presence of of God himself. This is our hope, an anchor of the soul. This is our expectation. Turn with me now to the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Listen to what he says in verses 5 and 6. And here we find that Paul, he is recording the words, rehearsing the words uh, that Moses spoke in Deuteronomy chapter 31 at verse 6, how that God promised Israel he would never leave them nor forsake them. If they could hold to that promise under the Old Testament covenant, how much more sure can we be of this promise today under the blood covenant of the Lamb of God? Listen to what he says in verses 5 and 6. Let your lives be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee, 
so that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now that word hope that we find over there in the sixth chapter at verse 19, it means expectation. We've got a strong expectation in our wonderful Lord because even now we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But here in this 13th chapter, 5 and 6, we find a title that's given to our wonderful Lord. And it's the title Helper. And it means reliever. It means one that breathes life back into us once again. Just this week, we were working around the church facility here on this beautiful campus. And I was trimming hedges, and it's with a, a pole hedger. And it weighs about 18 pounds, and it's where you can reach up high. And boy, my arms would tighten, and my wife was helping me some. She said, are you ready to move on? Are you ready to go to the next one? And I would say to her, let me get my breath just a moment. Let me, my arms rest and let my muscles recoup a little bit before we move on. I've got to get my breath. Oh, sometimes in the difficulties of life, like that pole saw, that pole trimmer that you hold up that weighs 18 pounds. You go down through those hedges and your arms tighten and you run out of breath and your muscles need oxygen. We can boldly say the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my reliever. He resuscitates us. All oh, that word resuscitate. That's an important word. I visited in the hospital so many times. Dying people and above their bed, it would have these letters. D-N-R. Do not resuscitate. Someone that has a living will. And they have decided that all that's been done that can be done. Uh, they don't want anything else done. They don't, want to, they don't want to be revived. They don't want to be shocked. Uh, they don't want to be uh, CPR performed on them. Uh, they're ready to go. Do not resuscitate. They have determined that medically according to their own will. But all oh, in this race that we are in, according to the 12th chapter, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, so that we can run this race that has been set before us. There are going to be times that we're going to need to be resuscitated. We're going to need Him to breathe life into us and to revive us. He is our expectation. And He is our resuscitation. He is the one that relieves us and gives oxygen back into the blood flow. And oh, it's His blood. But we need oxygen so that our muscles will be revived and we can go on and work for Him and serve Him. Now the reason that we have this expectation and the reason that we have this resuscitation is because we've got representation. And again, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was tempted in all points, even as we are, yet he without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need, expectation, resuscitation, all because we've got representation. Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lives. Listen to the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews, verses 23 through 28. Truly, there were many priests, but they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, oh, praise his name, he hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for us, there he is at the right hand of the Father. We have expectation. We can have resuscitation. Life can be breathed into us once again because we have representation. And then again, back to that 12th chapter, the things that can be shaken are going to be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken, they might remain. Look at it once again. The diagram of the tabernacle in the wilderness 
and how that it became uh, Herod's temple after Solomon's temple was destroyed before they went into the Babylonian captivity about 600 B.C. And there they had all the elements of the tabernacle in the wilderness from the door to the brazen altar to the brazen laver to the table of showbread. I'll tell you what these things mean later on. And then again the lampstand and the mercy seat, the place of reconciliation. But all of that was shaken and destroyed. But Jesus, He remains to be the one that is preeminent. He remains to be the one that represents us at the right hand of the Father. And so we put it all together. Hope, expectation. Help, He breathes life into us. Resuscitation. Representation, He's our great high priest that's passed into the heavens and He's at the right hand of the Father, even at this very moment, making intercession for us. Our foundation, the unshakable person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the close, let me mention these things to you. Do you believe today that Jesus was pre-existent and co-equal with the Father in eternity past? Do you believe that Jesus is the motivation for all of creation, everything that we see and enjoy? Do you believe in the incarnation, that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us? Do you believe in His sinless perfection? Do you believe that the crucifixion was a necessity? Do you believe that the resurrection was a verification of His sinless perfection? Do you believe in the ascension that He passed into the heavens? I believe it today. Oh, I want to go further with you. I believe these messages are going to be a blessing. But right now, if you don't know Him, turn to Him, look to Him, call upon Him. He's able to save to the uttermost. Until the next time, it's my prayer that the Lord will richly bless.